All right, hello once again. This is Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College, and it's part of the Rankin Technical College AWD or Application and Website Development Program, and in particular the AWD 1111.NET Framework with Web Databases class. I've been creating a series of video presentations based on the book that will be used for the AWD 1111 class in the fall 2019 semester. That book will be ProASP.NET MVC5, an APRES text by Adam Freeman. I am currently in Chapter 19 of 27, and we're on page 534, dealing with a fallback controller. The author says at the top here, custom controller factories must return an implementation of the iController interface as the result of the create controller method. Otherwise, an error will be displayed to the user. That means that you, the programmer, need to have a fallback position for when you request processing when the request you are processing does not target any of the controllers in your project. By default, the MVC framework selects a view based on the controller value in the routing data, not the name of the controller class. So, in the example, the author says, if I want the fallback position to work with views that follow the convention of being organized by controller name, I need to change the value of the controller route routing property like this. This change will cause the MVC framework to search for views associated with a fallback controller and not the controller that the routing system has identified based on the URL that the user requested. There are two important points to be made here. First, not only does the controller factory have sole responsibility for matching requests to controllers, but it can change the request to alter the behavior. Okay. The second point, as it says, while you are free to follow whatever conventions you want in the controller factory, you still need to know what the conventions are for other parts of the MVC framework. So on 535, as you can see on the screen right here, instantiating controller classes. There are no rules about how you instantiate your controller classes, but it's a good idea to use the dependency resolver we introduced way back in Chapter 6. This allows you to keep your custom controller factory focused on mapping requests to controller classes and leaves issues like dependency inject to be handled separately and for the entire application. The author says you can see how I used it here. The static dependency resolver dot current property returns an implementation of the I dependency revolver resolver interface, which defines the get service method. You pass a system dot type, op type object to the method and get an instance of it in the return. All right. Two other methods are in the I controller factory interface. They are the get controller session behavior method used by the MVC framework to determine if the session data should be maintained for a controller and the release controller method called when the controller object created by the create controller method is no longer needed. The author says here my implementations of the get controller session behavior and release controller methods are suitable for most projects and can be used pretty much verbatim. Of course, you should always look at it to be sure. We tell the MVC framework to use the custom controller factory through the controller builder class. You need to register a custom factory, all right, which means using the application start method in global ASAX. Let's just grab the whole shebang. Copy it to the clipboard. Go back over here, find our global ASAX. 
all right and we replaced it with the one that's shown in the textbook on page 536 yep 536 the author says here once the controller factory has been registered it will be responsible for handling all the requests that the application receives you can see the effect of the custom factory by starting the project so let's do a save all and let's start the project the browser will requ request the root URL which will be mapped to the home controller by the routing system so it should come in here and say controller product action index that's what's shown in figure 19.2 on the bottom of page 536 When it received, receives a request from the routing system, this factory looks at the routing data to find the value of the controller property and tries to find a class in the web app that meets the following criteria. Number one, the class must be public. Number two, the class must be concrete, meaning that it cannot be abstract. Number three, it must not take generic parameters. Number four, the name of the class must end with controller. And number five, the class must implement the iController interface. The default controller factory class maintains a list of these classes in the application, so it does not need to perform a search every time a request arrives. This default controller factory class follows the convention over configuration pattern. You do not need to register your controllers in a configuration file because the factory will automatically find them for you. If you want to create custom controller factory behavior, you can configure the settings of the default factory or, or override some of the methods. On page 300, 500 and 37, the author discusses here prioritizing namespaces and he mentions here in chapter 16 I showed you how to prioritize one or more namespaces when creating a route this was to address the ambiguous controller problem where controller classes have the same name but reside in different namespaces it is the default controller factory that processes the list of namespaces and prioritizes them If you have an application that has a lot of routes, it can be more convenient to specify priority namespaces globally so they are applied to all the routes. In listing 19.8 on pages 537 and 538, it shows you how to do this in the application start method of global ASAX. So let's grab this. And the author mentions, I use the static controller builder dot current dot default namespaces dot add method to add namespaces that should be given priority. 
The order in which I add the namespaces does not imply any kind of search order. All of the namespaces defined by the add method are treated equally, and the priority is relative to those namespaces which have not been specified by the add method. In other words, the controller factory will search the entire application if it can't find a suitable controller class in the namespaces defined by the add method. All right, 538, customizing default controller factory controller instantiation. As it says, there are a number of ways to customize how the default controller factory instantiates controller objects. The most common reason for customizing is to add support for dependency injection. There are several ways of doing this. All right. Now, what's mentioned here, starting on the bottom of page 538, using the dependency resolver and it says the default controller factory will use a dependency resolver to create controllers if one is available again that was covered back in chapter six next using a controller activator you can also introduce dependency injection into controllers by creating a controller activator you create this activator by implementing the iController activator interface shown here on the top of page 539. This interface contains one method called create. That method is passed a request context object describing the request and a type that specifies the controller class that should be instantiated. To demonstrate this, the author has added a new class called custom controller activator.cs in the infrastructure folder. Then we will replace that code that comes there naturally with the code listing that is on page 539 right here. The iController activator implementation, the author calls it simple, but as always, simple is a relative term. If the product controller class is requested, it responds with an instance of the customer controller class. This is not something you would want to do in a real project, but demonstrates how you can use the iController activator interface here to intercept requests between the controller factory and the dependency resolver. To use a custom activator, you need to pass an instance of the implementation class to the default controller factory. All right. And so in other words, we're going to again update the global.asax file to what's shown on the bottom here of page 539. and the top of page 540. All right. You can see the effect of the custom activator if we save, run the project, and iterate over to product. We can override methods in the default controller factory to customize the creation of controllers. Table 19.3 describes the three methods which can be overridden, those being create controller, get controller type, get controller instance. 
each performs a separate role. Once the controller factory has created an instance of a class, the framework needs a way of invoking an action on that instance. If you derive the controller from the controller class, this is the responsibility of the action invoker, which is discussed here. The action invoker, as it says, implements the iAction invoker interface. And notice it has only a single method, invoke action. The parameters are the a controller context object and a string that's the name of the action to be invoked. The result type is a Boolean. A value of true indicates the action was found and invoked or a value of false indicating the controller has no matching action. The author came in and defined another class in the infrastructure folder. That class is called custom action invoker dot cs the default boilerplate code will be removed and replaced with the code that you see on the bottom portion of page 541 and as the author says on 542 this action invoker does not care about the methods in the controller class. In fact, it deals with the actions itself. If the request is for an index action, the invoker writes a message directly to the response. If the request is for any other action, it returns false, which causes a 404 not found error to be displayed. The action invoker associated with a controller is obtained through the controller.actioninvoker property. To demonstrate this, the author added a new controller to the example product, project rather called Action Invoker. There are no action methods in this controller. It depends on the action invoker to process requests. You can see how this works by, again, starting the application and now navigating or iterating our way over to the action invoker slash index URL. I think I spelled anything wrong here. I don't think it's case sensitive, but we'll check. Shows you what I know. All right, the author says he is not suggesting you implement your own action invoker, and if you do, he does not suggest you follow his lead, all right, because there are better ways of doing it. The author, I believe, and I applaud his effort here, is trying to show you what he considers to be the most intuitive way of doing a lot of this stuff. The built-in action invoker on the bottom of page 542 
This is the controller action invoker class. Has some sophisticated techniques for matching requests to actions. Unlike the author's implementation in the previous section, the default action invoker operates on methods. To qualify as an action, a method must meet the following criteria. Number one, it must be public. Number two, it must not be static. Number three, the method must not be present in system.web.mvc.controller or any of its base classes. Number four, the method must not have a special name. First two criteria are simple enough. For the next, executing any method that is present in the controller class or the base classes. means that methods like toString and getHashCode aren't going to be allowed to work and you wouldn't want that. By default, the controller action invoker finds a method that has the same name as the requested action. So for example, if the action value that the routing system produces is index, then the controller action invoker will look for a method called index that fits the action criteria. All right, I'm way over. So we will start on page 543 using a custom action name in just a couple.